This film is the creation of some 150 Canadians who, like their grandparents, volunteered for war, the Great War. Not to fight it, but to remember it in an unforgettable way. To voyage to Europe and into the past, we picked 14 to follow in their grandparents' footsteps. We put them through a First World War training camp. Then in Montreal, the final 150 descendants are chosen, trained, and become an army. To fight their first battle, they come to a meadow that harks back to the ground where the Canadians endure the first gas attack. They are joined by actors to play Sandy Gow's ancestor, Colonel John McRae. Greg Kelly's great-grandfather, Canon Frederick Scott. I'll be with you. And Kate Sarsfield's relative, Talbot Papineau. A man who might have been prime minister, but who with thousands of others, chooses a soldier's path to create a country. Fire well! We supply an air force and real machine guns. We ask them to bring the Great War alive like it's never been done before. The sake of 325,000 who fought, a staggering two-thirds of whom are killed or wounded. And they did. There was two sides of life as a soldier. One was very monotonous and boring, and you're waiting uh, for someone to attack, but at the same time, you're not sure if you want them to. Bend your left elbow more. Lift it, lift it, lift it, stop. Some of you are perfect, some less so. Push it up onto the shoulder. That's better. Slope arms, but... Like many of their grandparents, the Canadians feel they are being treated as colonial cannon fodder. As it comes down like that. No, that wasn't very good. They Get grind that. their teeth and try hard to keep insubordination Hands under control. Don't move it until I tell you to. Squad three. Don't change your hands. But we're being almost far too respectful. We didn't have a reputation as terribly respectful. No. I remember my great great grandfather in his book, he would say that when generals well, would come by and when I go on. after they would kind of, you know, laugh at them a bit. Out of the moment, when you take them off. I would never do that. Two may march at ease. Sling your rifles over your right shoulder. Taft Gillingham's great uncle led these very same drills 90 years ago. His great uncle had moved to Canada and joined the Canadian Army when war broke out. A truly Canadian army, an army based not so much on who you know, but on how well you do the job. But young men still have to be goaded into killing other young men wearing different uniforms. I mean, young men and women are resilient. You're optimistic. You don't think you'll die. That's why I can eventually convince you to go across the channel and go into a filthy trench and attack Germans. I'll get you to charge machine guns. The young men think they're immortal. It's the job of sergeants and officers to assure them that's true. There's a bullet made that'll kill you, lads. You'll make it. All of the training has the most serious of purposes. It is all about learning how to avoid being killed and learning how to kill. Don't go for the chest. Too many ribs, too many bones up there. You want to get him there, just under the belt buckle. It's all nice, soft and squidgy there. If you stick him in the ribs, the blade gets stuck behind the bayonet. It's very embarrassing and the dead German stuck on the end of your rifle. Very inconvenient. Go for the soft, squidgy bits. Does the most damage. Even if you don't kill him, he'll die of peritonitis later. And you're going to pull the rifle back. And it... ah! sir, sir, they're using gas. They're using to avoid gas. panicking the oncoming reinforcements, 
Canon Scott makes the soldiers swear an oath. Those boys are going to the battlefield anyway. I want you to promise me that you will not say a word. Do you promise me? I promise, sir. Where are we going, sir? Depends on what kind of lives we've lived, boys. <laughs> Our Indian people, our Aboriginal people, uh, Indian, Inuit, and Métis were here as well. We fought and died in these same battlefields and in the skies overhead. And um, it's just unfortunate that that fact is often overlooked within the reading and writing of Canadian military history. Even though we were actively being denied the full rights and benefits of Canadian citizenship at home, we were nevertheless at the very forefront in fulfilling abroad what is arguably that single most onerous and profound obligation of citizenship in donning the sovereign's uniform and in bearing arms against the nation's enemies. By the way, I have accepted a staff appointment with a promotion. Captain Papineau is leaving us, but we hope not for long. I have no idea I was so bound by ties of affection to the regiment until I came to leave it. Charlie, you take care of these guys. I will, and you watch out for yourself. I am to be the official eyewitness, having to write all communications and descriptions of all the coming battles and the history. Return for the captain! Up, up! Hooray! Up, up! Hooray! You know this is suicide. The people here, their job is to defend the front line. Your job is to help make it safer for them. At night, it's safe to move around in the trench. It's safe for sentries to stand with their heads over the top because no one can see them. What shows up is movement. And you're out in no man's land and a flare goes up, the minute it goes up, you freeze. It doesn't matter what you're doing, you freeze. It's movement that they're looking for.